At the edge of the known world, a mystery. How did an ancient people, so-called savages and cannibals, cross over 25 million square kilometers of open ocean in primitive canoes in one of the great expeditions of all time? It's baffled experts for centuries, but today scientists and adventurers are uncovering surprising new clues. Who they were, where they came from, and they may have reached the Americas hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus. of explorers. They conquered the Pacific long before the Europeans. Then, all traces of them and their homeland seemed to disappear. Until now. Who were these people? What happened to them? And what was their secret? Easter Island, a tiny speck in the Pacific, thousands of kilometers from anywhere. This famed island, known as Rapa Nui, is home to the mysterious statues. But the greatest mystery is the people themselves. How did they get here? Two young researchers are determined to answer that question. We're trying to find answers to a large controversy about where the people on Easter Island originate from. Who were the first people to live here? And how did they locate and settle in one of the most remote places on Earth over a thousand years ago? By using DNA research, we hope to be able to uncover some of the mysteries that surrounds this island. We're looking for the oldest people on the island and the most, what they say here, puro. Somebody who has a genealogy that is Rapa Nui for many generations back on both sides, mother and father. Taking genetic samples from the elders, they hope to find proof of their origins. Su sangre está muy fuerte. Sí, sí, qué bueno. What we do now is take DNA from a woman whose last name indicates that she has a very interesting family tree. So it's important for us to be able to trace this. El padre de tu padre. Se llama Matías. But it will take weeks for them to collect and test all the DNA samples. But right away, they're fascinated by what they hear from the elders. They say their forefathers came from a lost island continent known as Hiva, somewhere in the Pacific. Nuestra historia dice de que cuando el continente Hiva se hundió una explosión, desaparecieron y toda la gente emigraron. Stella and Yurita are determined to uncover the truth about those adventurers and their lost continent of Hiva. Together with a group of scientists, they intend to follow the trail back to see where it leads. It's so fascinating to be here on the hunt. Right down here. The elders say that this corner of the island is the starting point where the first inhabitants arrived, led by a ruler called Hutu Matua. We are standing on the beach where legend says that the very first king, Hutu Matua, arrived on the island. And Hutu Matua, he originated from the lost continent, Hiva. As the researchers continue their work, other experts are following the same trail across the Pacific, starting at a set of islands over 3,000 kilometers to the northwest, a remote chain known as the Marquesas, part of the vast territory of Polynesia. Like Easter Island, much of the Marquesan past remains a mystery. Start in this corner, bring this down to 50, and then clean it clear across. Okay. Dr. Barry Rowlett has been working here for the past 20 years. 
determined to find evidence of the lost Polynesian homeland. On va, voilà, on va continuer là. Who were the ancient people who lived here? Could they have colonized the vast Pacific? We're digging through the pop deposit in order to get down to the richer uh, cultural deposit, which has all of the artifacts left by the people who once lived here. He and his team are excavating a remarkable coastal site, one of the oldest in East Polynesia, finding clues that date back over a thousand years. Something made out of iron. Clues that just may shed light on the Easter Islanders and the Polynesian shrouded past. Hey, Kio, c'est quoi ça? Rola believes that the ancient clan that lived here did colonize the vast Pacific. This is really nice. Middle to late uh, 19th century. And evidence like this bone ornament is helping him make the case. This one's going in the museum. But his theory goes against everything experts believe for years. The first reports from European travelers in the 1700s spoke of lush green islands with a dark side. A land of tattooed cannibals, primitives who carried the skulls of their enemies as trophies. Marquesas was labeled one of the most savage places on earth. Its people, simple barbarians. We're going to go down here and across the river. The most controversial element of ancient Marquesan life took place deep in the jungle. Religious ceremonies, notorious for human sacrifice. When a priest uh, called for a human victim, then the people would go to a neighboring valley and just uh, grab whoever they could. were offerings, brutal and highly ritualized, known to all the clansmen here. The meat of the victim is consumed by the chiefs and the priests, not as food, but as a kind of ancient communion. It was not cannibalism to feed the population. It was in a highly ceremonial and religious uh, context. It's no wonder early explorers saw the Marquesans as savages. They had almost no written language, no history, and by that time, they were isolated, barely traveling at all. But Dr. Rowlett is finding clues that the Marquesans' ancestors were more sophisticated, more civilized than anyone imagined. We're going to uh, cross the uh, river uh, here. Centuries of thick jungle growth hide the secrets of that civilization. Joseph, on va débrouiller un peu. Vaitahu was one of the most densely inhabited valleys in the past. There's evidence of an intricate society with a complex social order of priests and chiefs. So here we have the residence of one of the uh, chiefs. This is the uh, retaining wall of the uh, chief's uh, platform. Look at the size of the boulders in the base of the wall. I'm six foot. This wall must be a good uh, eight feet uh, tall. It's one of those cases where size really does matter because the size of the stone and the size of the uh, walls was a reflection of the uh, status of the person living here. The most powerful chiefs command the construction of massive stone platforms known as pai pai, foundations for housing and public ceremonies, all part of an elaborate, well-ordered communal structure. 
For a young man growing up here, the first rite of passage comes in the form of an intricate tattoo. The evidence shows that tools made of fish and human bone or shark's teeth were used to force ink into the skin. Pigment for the tattoo is made from ash of a cooked tree nut. Until death, the story of his every battle will be tattooed into his flesh. For this young man, a remarkable journey is beginning. Deep in the Marquesan jungle, Rowlett makes a surprising discovery. This is it, this is it. Oh, here are the petroglyphs. Here in French Polynesia is a startling echo from Easter Island. Petroglyphs and large tikis, like the great statues there. This is one of the a few uh, petroglyph sites that we know of in the in the valley. Tikis and petroglyphs are images that represented deified ancestors. The head was the most uh, sacred part of the of the body. So what you see here is just the representation of the eyes of the tiki. These petroglyphs are really interesting because they're so similar to the ones that we find on Easter Island. Other than Easter Island, the Marquesas are one of the only few places on Earth where you'll find this kind of giant tiki. It's an intriguing link. The first hint of a Polynesian homeland. But the hunt for proof is just the beginning. Battle of the Pacific sponsors History Defined on National Geographic Channel. On an isolated string of islands in the Pacific, Dr. Barry Rowlett and his team are trying to find evidence to support a controversial theory. We're going to bring all the uh, squares down to 75. For centuries, scientists believed that ancient Polynesians were too primitive to navigate the vast Pacific and colonize other islands. Earlier scientists and archaeologists believed that it was very difficult to travel across the ocean, and so that once Polynesians reached islands such as the Marquesas, people were isolated with no further voyaging. The Polynesians were seen as accidental settlers blown by chance across the waters, marooned on their islands. But Rowlett believes they were much more sophisticated. We're going to call this layer of sea because it's starting to get uh, darker there, we can see already. That they intentionally made long round trip journeys for trade and colonization. We're looking for archaeological evidence of inter-island voyaging and exchange. It's a fascinating theory, but he needs physical evidence to prove it. Let's see what you got. What do you think about this? This is unusual. Mm. It's, like, it's a marine uh, animal. So far, he hasn't found anything definitive. Only certain artifacts are useful as a window into the past, and Rowlett doesn't have what he needs. Until... Jackpot? Yeah. Uh, what do you have? Fish hook. Oh, beautiful. Wow, jackpot. This is a pearl shell fish hook. Try to clean it off. It's unusual that we find an unbroken fish hook like this in the excavation. So I'm just recording the location of that fish hook we found. The fish hook is made of pearl shell. And that's their first major clue. It's quite rare because it grows best in lagoons, and there are no lagoons in the Marquesas. This fish hook must have come from somewhere else. But the closest island with lagoons harboring this kind of pearl shell is over 1,000 kilometers away in the Tuamotu island chain. How could shells from that far away have made it here? We think it's quite possible that the larger pieces of pearl shell that we find here in the site actually 
are coming from the Tuamotus and may have been exchanged between archipelagos. It's a good start, but he can't prove the inter-island trade. And with the ancient vessels long gone, evidence is hard to come by. Because the wooden canoes that Polynesians used are not preserved in the archaeological record, then we have to look for other evidence if we want to study inter-island exchange and voyaging. As the dig continues, another find takes them one step closer. A kind of ancient blade, a cutting tool known as an adze. It was the most important tool in ancient Polynesia. We're especially interested in the stone adzes. This is an incredible one. Adzes were the basic uh, woodworking tools for, for Polynesians. It's unusual to find one that is so large. This weighs at least 10 pounds. Rowlett has been finding something unexpected about these adzes. We found that in the uh, deepest deposits of this site, more than half of the adzes are made of stone that was brought to Tahawata. The stone used to make these tools does not exist on this island. Like the fish hook, it must have come from somewhere else. And in this case, they have an idea where. If they can prove it, it'll be solid evidence of long distance trade voyages. Rowlett has enlisted volcanologist Dr. John Sinton to join his search. Our goal was to try to find the actual quarry where the rocks were being produced. Others before them have attempted to locate the quarry, but failed. Rowlett and Sinton charter a helicopter for the distant island of Eau. Remote, uninhabited, Eau is hundreds of kilometers from Rowlett's dig site. But they believe the stone found here might be a match for their adzes. On a bright morning, the helicopter pilot drops them off on the distant island. We jumped out of the helicopter. He took off and told us he would be back in five days. Roller and Sinton head deep into the wild, tangled forest of Eo. They have food and water for just five days. Eo is known as an island of ill fortune, inhabited by the spirits of the ancient people. After four days of hunting, they've got nothing, and they're exhausted. Searching, running up and down the, the ridges, across the, the plateau, searching everywhere for the quarry. No drinking water, no water to wash with. We were absolutely dirty and stinking by that time. For three days, they'd had no luck at all. The day before we were supposed to be picked up by the uh, helicopter, we were bushwhacking across a small ravine, and that's where we found the workshops for chipping the adzes. This may be the breakthrough they've been looking for, the stone source for the ancient tools. When we started to dig through the piles of flake, we realized there was nothing but, but stone debitage. From hundreds of years of, of chipping away to manufacture these adzes. They look like the right kind of stone fragments, but they have to prove it's a match. Rowlett and Sinton take samples back to the lab to test their theory. This rock comes from the island of Eau in the Marquesas. We recognize this rock as what archaeologists call core, that is the primary source rock from which adzes could be fabricated. Dr. Sinton compares the source rock brought back from Eau with Rowlett's adzes. He needs to heat the rock into a molten form to analyze its chemical composition. Chemical composition is like the fingerprint of the sample. When people find artifacts elsewhere in the world, if they have this identical chemical composition, most likely the sample really did come from AO. The liquefied rock is pressed into glass discs that will allow Sinton to analyze the chemistry. The results of the study are striking. The raw material at the quarry is identical in chemistry to these artifacts that are found all over the island. These two are, in fact, an exact match. It's a solid link between two distant islands. We found the quarry. They had established a major ads manufacturing complex on AEL and were exporting the ads to Tahiti, the Tuamotus, and Mangadeva. With the same Eo adzes turning up from the Marquesas to Tahiti, 
is evidence of a regular trade route covering hundreds of thousands of kilometers, much further than anyone imagined. This discovery from Dr. Rowlett and his colleagues is transforming the study of ancient Polynesia. This was a revelation because it started to show that there were voyaging spheres that linked the Marquesas and other islands in central Polynesia, what we refer to now as this East Polynesian homeland. The adzes are hard evidence of two-way, intentional, long-distance voyaging. This is a radically different idea or, or view of Polynesian societies because instead of looking at them as being isolated, we now see a lot of interaction and communication. Dr. Rowlett's dramatic discoveries suggest prehistoric Polynesian societies were more sophisticated than earlier experts thought. Now, the crucial question is, did they travel all the way to Easter Island? And what truth lies behind the story of Hotu Matua and the lost continent of Hiva. On Easter Island, the elders are positive their forefathers came from an ancient homeland called Hiva. To them, the facts are clear. Hiva is described as a land of green and jagged cliffs, ruled by tattooed warriors and fierce clans. Conflicts erupt, and rival clans go to war. Chief Hotu Matua prepares his men for battle. They are fighting for control of the island, fighting for a homeland. Chief Hotu Matua and his men lose a decisive battle. Defeated, they must flee. Hotu Matua must find a new home for his people. The high priest dreams of a faraway island to the east, in the direction of the rising sun. Hotu Matua knows they must leave the island before more of his men are killed. He commands scouts to search for the island in the priest's dream. <laughs> That's the Easter Islanders' story. But could ancient Polynesians from the Marquesas region have traveled so far, thousands of kilometers across the ocean? Did they even have the right vessels? That's the huge question boat restoration expert Bono Louis is wrestling with. On a conçu cette pirogue là. On a été, on a, on a, été, on a fait des recherches. C'est une pirogue de guerre. Il a survécu. With few written records of their maritime past, Louis is working from knowledge passed down orally through the centuries to rebuild a traditional wooden canoe. Et le modèle, d'après l'histoire, on dit le shape a été pris sur le coco. Parce qu'elle a un modèle demi-arrondi en dessous et elle a la forme plate. The canoe is made from a special kind of tree found here. Perfect material for long distance travel. D'après les, les histoires, l'histoire, les anciens, ils prennent plutôt le bois de. C'est un bois qui est léger et résistant. Bono Louis grew up here, 
over 3,000 kilometers from Easter Island. But remarkably, he has heard the very same stories as those islanders, stories of a defeated tribe that set off on an epic journey. D'après les histoires, l'histoire, à moi ici, certains clans qui est obligé de, de partir parce qu'il y a la, il y a la mort derrière. Il n'y a pas d'autre possibilité de, de s'enfouir avec des pirogues pour passer. Et ça, ça leur donne du courage pour découvrir les îles, les autres îles où on peut habiter. They load up in preparation. The final piece of cargo was sacred stone from Hiva on the voyage to their new homeland. And so Hotu Matua and his people begin an epic journey. A voyage that could take them across thousands of kilometers of open ocean. They will battle stormy weather, rough seas, and blazing hot sun as they venture into the unknown. The canoe will be their home for many weeks. But with no land en route, food and fresh water will be scarce. S'il n'y a pas assez de nourriture, donc il euh, y, y, y a ce don. Et s'il n'y a pas de pluie, il y, 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 y a danger. All they have are a few coconuts and whatever fish they can catch. Ils pêchent souvent des requins. Comme c'est un poisson qui est très dangereux. Danger is all around and the distant hope of a homeland far off on the horizon. This is the Islander's story. For Bono Louis, one key fact is about to check out. Setting sail, he and his team soon find out that these ancient style canoes really are seaworthy. Bono Louis also knows one more crucial piece of information that the island he's sailing from goes by the ancient name of Hiva Ua. In fact, according to an ancient map, a 300-year-old document from a Tahitan high priest, many of the islands in this region originally went by the name of Hiva. The name from the Easter Islanders' stories. It's the present-day location of the Marquesas, a remarkable link to the legend. After centuries, could they have found the mythical missing continent? It's clear that the ancient Polynesians sailed the South Seas. But the Pacific Ocean covers one third of the Earth's surface. Could they really have undertaken long distance journeys, like the amazing voyage to Easter Island? Many historians and scientists assumed that Polynesians crossed the ocean largely by accident, being blown off course. For a long time, the ancient Polynesians were considered too primitive to intentionally voyage to distant locations. But one clue shows that they may well have. It's a kind of ocean map known as a stick chart. Thin pieces of coconut fronds are tied together to represent ocean currents. Small shells attached to the frame show the location of land. It's a chart of islands visited, all part of the evidence that led Barry Rowlett to believe the ancient Polynesians traveled far across the Pacific with a plan to colonize the islands they found. Our new theory is that the discovery and settlement of Polynesia was a systematic and intentional process and not at all accidental. Previously, experts believed this long-distance voyage across the Pacific would have been impossible for two main reasons. Firstly, the wind. A trip to Easter Island would have taken them towards the rising sun, from west to east. But across the Pacific, the winds in the tropics blow in the opposite direction, from east to west along the equator. These are the trade winds, and many thought they'd make a trip east impossible. 
but Rorot has noticed something in these islands. At certain times of year, these winds actually shift. Today is an unusual day. Normally, the wind comes from the, from the mountains. Today, the wind is blowing from the ocean, from the west. Some of the earlier researchers just looked at the prevailing winds, and they didn't take into account the seasonal changes. These changing winds are called the westerlies. Any ancient sailor would have known about them. The westerly winds then will come and go. Polynesians would wait for them to come in order to sail to some place that would otherwise be difficult to get to. This would allow a canoe, like Hotu Matua's, to sail east with the wind at their backs. But there was still a second major obstacle, navigation. How did they pinpoint land in an immense ocean without a compass or any other tool? Nainoa Thompson and the Polynesian Voyaging Society are working to find answers. I really believe navigation it's at the core of who we are as people. Here it comes. They intend to prove their ancestors were able to sail on epic two-way journeys across the Pacific. Open the main. Easy. Easy. And that they have the navigation skills to do it. Let's turn up. Come on. Thompson is a master navigator. And then we're going to start to uni the canoe that way. He trained with one of the few people on Earth who knew the secrets of how the ancients once steered by the stars. Micronesian navigator Mao Pialu learned this craft through oral traditions, passed down from generation to generation, over 3,000 years. Everything you see on this canoe that we do today, fundamentally, it all came from Mao. How did the ancients find their way across the vast Pacific? And in a culture with no writing, how were routes and directions passed on? <laughs> Thompson believes it's through the same ancient art of celestial navigation that Master Mao saved from extinction before he died in the summer of 2010. When Mao passed away, all of a sudden he cannot come back on this deck anymore. Master Mao's death left Nainoa Thompson as one of the last navigators on Earth to pass down this knowledge. So when we come here and start talking about navigation, it's not some trivial academic intellectual exercise. We're setting the course. Now, I know a Thompson just needs to prove that this ancient knowledge would have allowed their ancestors to cross thousands of kilometers of open water to find their way to Easter Island. In the middle of the Pacific, the Polynesian Voyaging Society is trying to demonstrate that their ancestors could navigate vast stretches of open ocean long before the compass was even invented. Well, I'm going to get the sails up. Oh, pull up straight, pull up straight. Thompson's goal is to show that even a crew of young explorers with no modern instruments can find their way using his ancient knowledge. We're going to hold a course towards Tahiti. So for the f first part of the night, and then we'll have them hold a course back to Hawaii. So it'll be like we're going to Tahiti in the minds of these students, and then it'll be like coming home once we turn around. Their main tools come out at night. Like his ancestors, Nainoa has memorized a detailed map of the stars. But can he use this map to find his way across immense stretches of open ocean? The traditional star compass is very old. It's, as, as far as we know, it's probably 3,000 years old, and it's not magnetic, it's not in a little box. It comes from the heavens, it comes from nature, and it's defined by rising and setting stars that come out of the ocean and go in the ocean every night. Nighttime is interesting because it's a time when it's the best time and it's a time when it's the worst. When there are a nightlight tonight where there's so many clear stars, we have hundreds of opportunities to keep a very accurate course. Rising and setting points of the stars provide direction. So what direction are we heading? South east, south west. The night sky is like a dome that encloses the Earth in space. The dome revolves around the Earth on its axis. 
The canoe is at the center of the dome, fixed, with the world and the stars shifting in front of them. A perspective that would inspire the inventors of today's GPS. We use about 220 stars by name. So basically, 220 stars positioned in rise in the east and 220 in the west. But several hours into the night, Thompson is concerned. They've gone off course. He spots a telltale sign. If you look at Kamakau Nui Maui, yeah, you look at the head, the three stars in the head, and generally, they make a vertical line towards south. Kamakau Nui Maui is the Polynesian name for Scorpio. For thousands of years, ancient navigators have used this constellation as a heading towards south. When a scorpion transits and those stars are vertical, then, then the scorpion becomes you're heading towards Tahiti. So we got to go more to the east. So let's go open the back sail. We open the back sail to actually help steer us towards farther into the wind. So in this particular course, it will take us more into the east. So we want to head to Tahiti about 25 degrees. The crew hopes that they've made the right choice. Once you make a decision, you kind of go back later and change it. You know, you, it's done. And you got to go to the next decision, the next sunrise, the next sunset. This trip is just part of a much larger voyage Nainoa Thompson undertook not long ago. Using these 3,000-year-old techniques, he wanted to see if he could sail the canoe from the Marquesas to Easter Island with only ancient navigation, no modern tools. He and his team found their way and completed the entire trip in just over six weeks. Thompson's journey was the evidence researchers had been looking for. The proof that Hotu Matua could well have traveled from Hiva to Easter Island. That his journey may well have been much more than just a legend. Ahoy! I cannot honestly say that, that Hotu Matua was with us the whole way. He was navigating us the whole way. But I do know that for us, he, he was constantly on our mind his essence, you know, what he had accomplished, what he stood for, was certainly something that strengthened us as sailors on, on this voyage and gave us a sense of much more privilege to be there. My ancestors were exploring this ocean world, crossing much, much more miles and millions of square miles in the ocean than anybody other culture in the world. So we are relearning how intelligent, how strong, how courageous, and how capable our ancestors were. And that sense of pride in who we were give us a sense of pride of who we are today. The discovery of Easter Island by ancient Polynesians is one of the great feats of exploration in human history. But some scientists now believe that it may have been just the beginning. Is it possible these ancient Polynesians came to the Americas hundreds of years before Columbus? On the hunt to retrace the voyages of the first Polynesians, the pieces are beginning to come together. These ancient travelers did have the tools and the knowledge to colonize the Pacific. But is there evidence to show they went all the way to Easter Island and beyond? The one real proof will be the blood of the Easter Islanders themselves. Back on Easter Island, the DNA research is just coming in. The final piece of the puzzle. We've managed to get 21 blood samples here on Easter Island from elders. So it'll be extremely exciting to see how they turn out. Their goal is to determine where the people of Easter Island originated from and how far their ancestors might have voyaged. The work is underway at a lab in Norway. Contrary to what a lot of historians and scientists have written about the Easter Islanders, they themselves think that they came from an ancient homeland called Hiva. And that's what we're trying to find out more about with our DNA work. When the results come back, Stirla is thrilled. Our work actually can confirm that the ancient Polynesians came from a central east Polynesian homeland. This is the proof they've been looking for. The Easter Islanders did come from Polynesia. 
Hoto Matua, or one of his countrymen, did make the long voyage across the ocean. It's what many have suspected, but it's never been proved until now. The genetic results have one extra surprise. All the samples that we tested, two were really interesting and surprising to us. These two have some South American DNA deep inside their genetic history. And that may point to even further voyages. The DNA results suggest that Polynesians traveled to South America hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus. It's an amazing theory. The Polynesians beat Columbus to the New World by centuries. Hey, hey. But can science prove it? Back on the Marquesas, Barry Rollett has stumbled on one surprising bit of evidence, the humble sweet potato. The sweet potato gives clues to understanding the extent of Polynesian voyaging. Today, it's found all over Polynesia, but it's not a native plant. It's native only to South America, and so it had to have been introduced to Polynesia. So how did it get there? Unlike the coconut, which can float on the ocean and survive many months at sea and then start growing if it lands on a deserted island, the sweet potato would just sink and die if it falls into the ocean. And so for it to get from South America to Polynesia, someone had to bring it here. Carbonized sweet potatoes found in Polynesia have been dated back as far as 1000 AD. Scientists believed that it may have been the South Americans themselves who introduced the sweet potato to Polynesia. But now, Rowlett's discoveries and the expeditions of the Polynesian Voyaging Society reveal that it was the Polynesians who had the knowledge, tools, and skill for long-distance round-trip voyaging. That has changed everything. Now, we believe that it was the Polynesians who reached South America and then came back with the sweet potato. Oh, hi. Polynesians traded and made contact with islands all the way from the South Seas to South America. They were the great explorers of their age. And the place they set out from was in fact a central homeland, what the Easter Islanders called Hiva. But this homeland is not quite what people had envisaged. Hiva did exist. It's just that the earlier scientists were looking for it in the wrong form. We believe that this was the homeland from which people left to settle Easter Island, Hawaii, and New Zealand. Easter Island, Hawaii, and New Zealand form three points of the Polynesian Triangle. At over 25 million square kilometers, it's the largest cultural territory in the world. Europeans and Americans who have grown up on continents tend to think of the land as their home, but Polynesians see the sea as their home. Their view of the world is this enormous ocean or territory with islands throughout. Rolla believes that Hiva was the central homeland from where ancient Polynesians created a water continent. Metaphorically speaking, Hiva may not have been a continent per se, but instead a group of islands that were connected by long distance voyaging. At over 25 million square kilometers, the Polynesian Triangle will be the third largest continent on the planet, but it will be doomed to disappear in later years when they stopped long distance voyaging. The disappearance of the continent or the sinking of the continent then was simply the breakdown in the interaction sphere that led to the isolation of these islands. For Rowlett, all the facts add up. This is incredible when we consider that uh, Polynesians were crossing oceans, crossing the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean in the world, centuries before Christopher Columbus. So the Easter Islanders' claims do make sense. Their forefathers were some of the great navigators on the most remarkable human journeys of their age, as they charted a course across an island world to colonize vast stretches of the Pacific. Polynesia is an ocean world. It's an ocean land. And from that perspective, this ocean is not what divides us on the Earth. It's what connects us. 
this ocean is the highway of our ancestors.